one of the things that we have to cover for the final part of chapter 3 on enzymes is something known as immobilized enzymes. Now, before we talk about immobilized enzymes, I want to start the lesson with a situation. I don't need you to memorize this situation, but it kind of helps to understand why immobilized enzymes are necessary. Imagine a person who is lactose intolerant, or this person has a condition known as lactose intolerance. Lactose intolerance in a person, for the most part, just means that their body is unable to synthesize adequate amounts of the enzymes lactase. Now, what exactly is the function of lactase? Lactase is a type of enzyme that is needed to break down lactose sugars. So if you are not able to produce enough of these enzymes in your digestive system, your ability to digest lactose sugars will be reduced. So what's the big deal? Now, imagine if you were to eat dairy products like cheese or milk or even ice cream, which contains a lot of a lot of lactose sugars, because your body is unable to digest the lactose sugars, it will start to cause gastrointestinal discomforts. Uh, usually you will have bloating, stomach pains, uh, you might even have diarrhea, quite bad diarrhea as well. So that's what happens right there to the person who has severe lactose intolerance. So the solution to this problem is very easy. If you have lactose intolerance, I mean, you can tell the person, just don't eat food that contains lactose. That means the person has to avoid cheese, the person might have to avoid milk, and also avoid, in most cases, ice cream, which contains quite a fair bit of lactose sugars as well. Now, telling a person to not to avoid eating ice cream, I don't know, to me personally, it sounds like a death sentence because I love ice cream. So one sort of solution to help this problem is by producing lactose-free milk, which means to say the milk does not contain lactose. So how do we do that? Well, as you can see in this situation here, the milk contains lactose sugar. The lactose sugar is a disaccharide, by the way. It's made up of alpha glucose plus galactose linked together by a glycosidic bond. You don't need to know that in detail. It's just good to know that it is a disaccharide. So lactose sugar is the problem here, and your body cannot break down the glycosidic bond if you have lactose intolerance. So what we can do is we can artificially add lactase enzymes to the milk mixture and what will happen is the lactase which is an enzyme will break down the glycosidic bond and make it become glucose and galactose and we add the enzyme to the milk before putting it into our body obviously so as you can see here the milk which contains the lactose has been broken down by the enzymes represented by those green color pac-man if you can't see it's green color don't worry you know what pac-man is right I, at least i hope to god you know what a pac-man is so those pac-mans represent the lactase enzymes and they have broken down the lactose sugar. So this is good. So the milk now has no lactose, yay, but the problem is the milk is contaminated with lactase. Boo! So why is it a problem if the milk is contaminated with the enzymes? You see, if you were to drink the milk and the milk still contains the enzyme lactase, the enzymes may cause allergic reactions in your body and we don't want that to happen. Number two, the presence of lactase might also affect the taste of milk. So we don't want the milk to be funny tasting. So is there a way that we can just remove the lactase enzymes? Some students will say, oh, what we can do is we can boil the milk to denature the enzymes. While that sounds like a good answer, the enzyme is still inside the milk. It's denatured, yes, but the enzyme is still inside the milk and it may affect the taste of the milk or it may cause allergic reaction. Some students will say, oh, just filter it. Use a simple filter. It's not as easy as that, though. So how do we solve this problem of the milk containing the lactase enzymes? We, that means we want to digest the lactose sugars, but we want to also make sure that the milk does not contain the enzymes. So the solution to this entire problem is by using a technology known as immobilized enzymes. Immobilized by definition just means stuck or cannot move. 
which means to say the enzymes are stuck to a place and they cannot move. So what we do here is we take the lactase enzymes and we will add it together with something known as the alginate beads. Yes, you do need to know what's uh, the name of the bead. It's good to know the name of the bead. It's called alginate. Alginate is a particular type of, uh, if I'm not mistaken, it's a polysaccharide. It's derived from seaweed. Now, if you can't imagine these beads, the closest thing you can imagine to is something like boba. I mean, I kind of like it, but here's the weird thing though, especially when you're slurping on the bubble tea, especially like the straw that you use. Right? So the moment you suck on the bubble tea, because you use too much suction, the bubble tea might go into your trachea. It might cause choking. And I have an irrational fear of that happening. Um, has that happened to me before? No. But every time I were to drink bubble tea, um, what I try to do, and I know I'm going to get judged for this, I'll drink the tea part first and then only I'll take a spoon and I'll try to drink the bubble tea. Okay, anyway, why? Okay, going off tangent, I'm really, really sorry. Coming back to alginate beads. So alginate beads are something like bubble tea, but at a smaller size. And please do not eat it. It's not edible. I mean, I don't think it is edible. Now, the interesting thing about alginate beads is it's water insoluble, which means to say it does not dissolve in water, and it's chemically inert. Chemically inert means to say that it's chemically, it's stable, and it doesn't really take part in any chemical reaction. And this is an example of the alginate beads, and you can actually uh, do this experiment to create the alginate beads in your laboratory. I do hope that your biology teacher talks about how to make immobilized enzymes. But theoretically speaking, what happens is we just take the alginate beads and we take the lactase enzyme and we stick it together. Now, how you stick it together, you don't have to know it for paper one or paper two. But the point here is the enzymes are now embedded or attached to the alginate beads. So can the enzymes just move around? No, they can't. So... What we can do is we can create a few of these alginate beads and just stick them into like a sort of a reservoir or a receptacle. And what we do is we just pour at the top of the beaker, the, the open, yeah, at the top of the container, you just pour your milk. And the milk contains the lactose sugars, which I'm just putting over there right now. So as the lactose as the milk flows through the alginate beads, what will happen, as you can see here, the active side of the enzymes are facing outwards, so it's exposed. So the sugars can attach to the active side of the lactase enzymes and the glycosidic bonds can be broken down to form glucose and galactose, the monosaccharides. And the monosaccharides just get, the once the lactose sugar has been broken down into its monosaccharides, the monosaccharides will just flow downwards using gravity and it will collect at the beaker in the bottom. And the interesting thing is, the beaker in the bottom will only contain the sugars, but it does not contain the enzymes, the lactase enzymes. Why doesn't it contain the lactase enzymes? Because the lactase enzymes are stuck on the beads, the alginate beads. And the alginate beads, some students will ask the question, won't the alginate beads cause any problems? For the most part, it doesn't because, like I said, the alginate beads are water insoluble. So the presence of milk will not react with the beads whatsoever and the beads are also chemically inert. They won't get broken down in the presence of milk. So that's the good thing about using the alginate beads in this case. So imagine a situation where the milk that has reached the bottom now let's say the milk has reached the bottom over here but as you can see i'm circling here there are still some lactose sugar in the milk that means not everything was completely broken down it's very easy what you can just do is you can just take the end product and you can just pour it over and over again until all the lactose sugar in the milk has been broken down so this is the interesting thing about immobilized enzymes the enzymes are stuck in the beads and you can reuse the enzymes as many times as possible so that's fantastic now there are a few advantages of using immobilized enzymes. The first thing is it prevents the end product contamination by the enzymes. As you can see the end product here, there are no enzymes contaminating the milk. So that's good. And the enzymes can be reused, which means to say the enzymes are always stuck there 
immobilized by the alginate beads so you can reuse the enzymes in the industrial setting in the industrial setting when you're using enzymes especially for manufacturing of specific substances enzymes are quite expensive and the fact that you're able to reuse the enzymes over and over again will lower the costs of manufacturing the lactose free milk and the immobilized enzymes, interestingly, tend to be more temperature and pH stable. Now, what does it mean by that? Let's just throw it out. Now, I have a free enzyme here. A free enzyme just means that the enzyme is able to move around. It's not immobilized. For example, please do not memorize this. At 40 degrees Celsius, the enzyme is able to function well. But at 50 degrees Celsius, the hydrogen bonds in the enzymes begin to break down, causing the shape of the 3D structure of the enzyme to change, and the active site will change. The, enzymes are, the enzyme is beginning to denature. At 60 degrees Celsius, the enzymes denature even more, so the chances of forming ES complex is almost non-existent. So it can work optimally at 40 degrees Celsius. At 50 degrees Celsius, it sucks, and at 60 degrees Celsius, it totally is unable to work at all. But immobilized enzymes, interestingly, the enzymes are partially embedded into the alginate beads. The hydrogen bonds within the enzymes are more protected. So in this case, they might actually be able to function at a greater temperature range. As you can see here, the beads at 40, the enzyme at 40 degrees Celsius, 50 degrees Celsius, and 60 degrees Celsius, the enzymes still remain quite stable. Yeah, at 60 degrees Celsius, as you can see, I don't know whether you can see that, but uh, the active site slightly changes, but it can still um, carry out, it can still form the ES complex. So it's stable over a greater temperature range, all right? And another situation also is it's quite stable over a great pH range as well for the very same reason. For example, please do not memorize this. The free enzymes function well at a pH of 7, but pH of 4 and pH of 10 will affect the ionic bonds and the hydrogen bonds within the enzymes, changing its 3D shape and then causing the enzymes to denature as well, so it cannot form ES complex. But the immobilized enzymes, the ionic bonds and the hydrogen bonds are more protected within the alginate beads, so they will not be significantly impacted by the pH. The reason for this is as follows, where I've mentioned here, the alginate beads provide more stability to the enzyme's 3D structure and the hydrogen bonds and ionic bonds are less likely to be disrupted or broken down by temperature changes or even pH changes. So these are some of the advantages of the immobilized enzymes that you should be aware of. And I hope you understand the final part of this chapter.